Welcome to Trash House Take. I'm Sam Mason Bell. Uh, today we're having one of our roundtable chats. I'm joined by Tom Lee Rutter and Kamal Yildirim. We're going to be talking about New York street movies from like, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, some particular directors. So how are you guys doing? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, I'm good. This is Kamal here. Thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. So, man. Likewise, it's a pleasure. It's been, it's been a while since we did the last one, so it's always good to get involved. Yeah, I really, I really wanted to like, because this is a weird one, because I, I kind of thought, all right, we'll just do street movies. And then street movies, when I, when I looked it up in more, I was like, that's not really what I'm talking about. It's just New York in particular. So it's a bit of a weird, specific kind of time frame. But there's some really interesting films out there, and it all kind of relates to what was happening in the world at the time, because New York was obviously in its worst crime time during the 1980s. So it all ties in quite yeah. nicely. It's funny because is it even acknowledged as an actual kind of genre or subgenre? Because um, it takes its cues from quite a few different recognised genres, I suppose, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It's like you've got your realism and then you've got a type, like, genre, like genre trappings as well. So That's what makes it so unique and that's why I thought it'd be interesting to just talk about those particular filmmakers and those particular films that were coming out around that time. Yeah, a lot of people do genre. say how much they love street films or street films or the booty street films and I always think, well, is it even recognised as a kind of subgenre? Because there's so many other subgenres with really less films in that in that category than there are street films because there's loads of notable street films. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. If it is in a subgenre, we should create it. That's just that's yeah, great. Because I, I, I definitely see it as a subgenre myself because so many Absolutely. so many films that fit inside that so many interesting films that sit inside that subcategory that I think it deserves to have its own kind of recognition really. Yeah, we should get the book out quick. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Moon rights. <laughs> that's it, yeah. Well, we're sticking with uh, good old New York, and um, I wanted to start like from the beginning. And in regards to uh, the sixties, when you had um, Andy Warhol with his factory, they were making very much street movies. And at the same time, you had Midnight Cowboy. So yeah, like as we were saying just before uh, we start recording, that sort of feels like the beginning of these kind of films. Well, John Selleshender came on these British, and in Britain you had the free cinema movement, which is what I. Lindsay Anderson started, and that's very gritty, slice of life um, documentary filmmaking. And there's obviously a lot of that in there, as well as shades of like from the realist kind of cinema verite as well. Mm. So he's obviously transporting a lot of that, those uh, those, you know, those styles and uh, traditions over into this American filmmaking. You know, I think that ties Andy Warhol's films quite well because see Andy Warhol had a very experimental style. And that, and he used obviously New York as a backdrop to kind of represent the films that he was talking about. And Sazinger came there and made Midnight Cowboy. So the kind of two, I'd say that the two of them are kind of almost working in parallel, parallel. You know, they're working at the same time, but almost parallel to each other, hmm. talking about the same yeah, genre in a different I mean, kind of way. Well, Warhol had in. his own. That's the Warhol had his own pocket money. Yeah. Sazinger was obviously with a studio, wasn't he? Yeah, getting away with it with a studio. I suppose as well, though, amazing, really. those films really look at the kind of subculture that was going on. And if you think about that whole cinematic swing when Easy Rider and those films were coming along where, you know, they were showing more of what culture, what was happening with culture and stuff. And of course, the higher point when it came to art and like music and film, New York and London, like those swinging sort of towns. Th these films, they, I don't know, they tried to show a more grounded version of that world because I think like the last scenes in Midnight Cowboy when they're at the party and it's all just psychedelic and it's all trippy but it's not when they're into the, that great um, oh, Elephant's Memory uh, band playing I think it's Elephant's Memory they're absolutely incredible yeah because it's all like acid acid kind of um, party vibe isn't it like the early Pink Floyd sort of stuff and it's just but it's not done in a welcoming way it's more of an in, kind of invasive sort of way yeah, they're even more isolated there. They're amongst fans, aren't they, really? Mm. I mean, I think it's, they've always said that it takes someone who's not American to paint a really vivid uh, picture of America. Well, even the fish eye, you know, I love all that use of fish eye and handheld. No, it works, it works so nicely. Anymore. It's That's the thing, because even well, like... It really does capture the grime. Yeah, definitely. And I think also, because he did a lot of work with the Beatles around the same time, didn't he, with music videos? 
So they were always... Yeah. And obviously, music videos involves a lot of, like, quicker editing and, and thinking more quick, flashy kind of imagery. So, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens in that film. And then when we kind of go more into the 70s, those street films sort of take on a bit more of the crime persona. And it's very particular that this time's, like, just at the end of... Um, or, or a middle point of Nixon. I'm thinking, like, Scorsese's Mean Streets. Yeah, well, Mean Streets is amazing. I mean, um, it, it, Scorsese obviously takes his cues a lot from the uh, Ali and the O'Realist films as well, yeah. like Roberto yeah. Rossellini films. And that's obviously got its lineage from, from those that, from that genre because it's all about that slice of life, using non-professionals and and trying to make it as uh, as gritty and as real as well, how he sees life, you know. And, mm. But obviously, as well, he was trying to kind of derive himself from the, the genre trappings of working for, say, Roger Gorman and ended up mm. as just another grinder filmmaker, even though it does share a lot of uh, like, similarities with that stuff. Similarities, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, mean, mean Streets is a great film for me as a student filmmaker. Mean Streets was, was a really big influence. Mike Scorsese's early work was a really big influence. And I think Taxi Driver tied it up really, really well. But yeah. Mean Streets had that kind of, like Tom said before, the cinema verite, the realism, but also obviously capturing that kind of lifestyle that he obviously witnessed growing up in Little Italy and wherever in, in, in New York. So it was, it was an, it's a very interesting, Mean Streets is a really, really interesting film. I think you know. I think, also, I, I think so. I think it is. I think Taxi Driver and, and Mean Street for me is is two masterpieces for me. That's a great, great, don't they? That's yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's another thing about those films, those street movies, is that you can visibly see the grain on all on all the films, and I love that about it. Cause I think it's like films. newsreel, sixteen millimeter. Exactly. Like, yeah. A lot of like you get in gear for stations and just use them. Yeah. Them in there. I think the French Connection had a big influence on that as well, the way that, that was shot, that kind of cinema verite style. Oh, I think that kind of t- yeah, yeah. that ties into that kind of that, you know representing the kind of New York of that time, you know, the whole corrupt pop kind of genre started to come in and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, I think I think Mean Streets is incredible, but I think kind of French Connection kind of really started that. That's kind um, of, oh yeah, because again, they were... look. And they're employing guerrilla tactics whilst making those yeah. films, like the chase, for instance. Yeah, I'm sure they need to put that woman in the woman in the baby. <laughs> yeah, I'll point in that. I mean, Freakin was an absolute lunatic. Really. Yeah, <laughs> 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 there's another yeah, they f- can't film that every director wants, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> every director is crazy. You know, yeah. he, got, he got his way. <laughs> but it's a great film. We'll, uh, we'll be coming back with uh, Fredkin later on because I want to talk a bit about Cruising, which, of course, again, is sort oh, yeah. of part oh, of that right, whole yeah. thing. Oh, but to, uh, to go back to Taxi Driver. Now, Taxi Driver, if I'm right, if I'm wrong, just correct me. Uh, it came out in, was it 75 or 76? Or was it 74? I think it was a bit early. Because I'm pretty sure I've... Mean Streets was about 72. I've got a feeling it might be 74. Uh, 76. It was, yeah, 76. It was 70, I think, yeah, 76 when it came out. Yeah, 76. So it was a bit, obviously, later. This is the thing. Yeah, if we did Foreman films at the start of the 70s. Then Mean Street was 73, is that right? Yes, I think it was 73. And then Taxi Driver is 76, definitely 76. Excellent. Yeah. And with 76 in particular, if, again, we look at American politics, we've just gone out of Nixon time and we're in the uh, Jimmy Carter years. And this particular time, you've, um, or you're pushing towards that Jimmy Carter years. There's a more positive sort of, um, America were doing their 200 year anniversary from the separation. America was going into a good place. And I like Taxi Driver, it examines that kind of, the person who's been used by that system, because you've got him as a Vietnam vet, and he's watching this like, in a weird way, because he's watching a lot of um, the this, this subculture walk around New York streets and he just sees them as scum and vermin kind of thing. And yet, like, it's still people being a bit more comfortable with being who they are on the streets at the same time. So it's, I don't know, there's a lot of underlining things with uh, toxic masculinity in a lot of these street movies as well. And Taxi Driver kind of really puts a finger well, on the um, 
there's a lot of Travis Bickles down there, there for sure, for certain. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I think they're rising. <laughs> but they're, they're more mainstream these days. You know, they're not the ones bubbling under the surface. They're the ones who are absolutely just, uh, out and loud and proud. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, ta- taxi drivers, like the portrayal of the taxi, um, the toxic masculinity is probably one of the most powerful and visceral ones I've seen in any film. I think the way that obviously. Dinero's performance and the way that Scorsese underlines, punctuates every single bit of his performance with visual clues Mm. that lets us know that this man's about to do something, you know, terrible or, depending on your viewpoint, good. Because obviously, for me, it also sets exactly, but because for me, it sets up this, it sets up a notion of it doesn't give you a clear cut as to whether Travis was bad or good. It just holds up a mirror and says, here's this guy. And that's, to me, the most interesting part of it is that, because in that time yeah. of Hollywood, that time of Hollywood, it's very clean cut. You know, you had your good guy and you had your bad guy and very clean. Whereas we were rooting for the, and we were rooting for a lunatic with an in-taxi driver and kind of understanding his perspective, which I thought was very, very different. I see in-taxi driver, I see a lot of um, French New Wave coming out, of, mm. coming out of that. Within, within the way that he presented the streets, the look, the grime. Yeah. And I think, I think obviously, the most of America was being influenced by French New Wave at that time, which it still is. It's certain. Definitely. Such a poetic flow to everything. And how it moves <laughs> about. We're scrolling along marquees on 42nd Street, but then it's scrolling into his notepad. You know, and so the flow yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, uh, that's still that one shot stays with me to this day. And every time I make a film, I'm looking at how can I make it, how can I tell something to the audience within a shot. And that one yeah. shot with Travis Bickle on the phone, and the camera just lingers off him for a second, looks down this empty corridor, and then comes back again. Yeah. And that, that, that scene in particular, I think, I think that scene in particular, I think what he was trying to do, in my personal take on it, was that he was trying to show how isolated this yeah, man there's was. There's no one there. There's no, no one there, there for right? him. His country's not there. not there. His people not there. Exactly. I think he was really with that one shot, and that's the power of Scorsese when he's at his best. Is that with one shot, he can tell you exactly what he's talking about, and that is powerful. I like mentioned you know, the key is to these street films is that there are no heroes or uh, yeah, yeah. anti-heroes. Well, the, I suppose there are anti-heroes, but there's no heroes or villains. It's just yeah. A lot of bad people just wallowing in this mess together. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I think what, what um, Sam was saying, that kind of bringing it into the political realm, was really, really strong because I think that's what Paul was saying at the time. Because obviously, he, I, I read an interview of him where he, he was talking about how angry he was when he directed it and how angry Paul Schrader was when he wrote it. And they were angry at the political system and they were angry at maybe Hollywood or whatever it was. And I think it comes out in that and the, the way that they bring it with the political angle. I think it's done really, really well. And obviously the way that Travis Bickle interacts with all the people in, in the film as well. It just, just makes you think how kind of linked in with the politics he really is because he really he just jaded that he got snubbed by Sybil Shepherds who worked in the lobby yeah. office. Yeah. <laughs> this, is the, this is the funny thing with um, the politics in that film. Like, because a street movie has that perfect opportunity to just be very observational. And obviously a taxi driver is a great character to use that. And with a lot of the politics, whenever people assume, oh, it's a, um, a Democrat in charge as opposed to Republican, that it's instantly better. But of course, these systems aren't that simple. And it's usually a lot, you know, there's a lot more levels to it. And I think um, weirdly, he sits kind of like in the middle. Because if I'm right, the guy, the politician in taxi driver is a Democrat. I could be wrong. It's like a little quiz uh, midway I, through. I can't actually remember that much detail of whether it was a. Uh, I can't remember that. No, I can't so, particularly. Yeah. I think I think that's maybe where Scorsese, you know, Scorsese didn't really want us to know whether it was a Democrat or a Republican. He was just exactly, yeah. the same. Yeah, yeah. The same thing you're going to get time in time out and because I think because Absolutely, we've seen it from Travis Bickle's perspective it kind of didn't make a difference who was in charge you're still going to get screwed at the end of the day because you're the everyman and the everyman which is the rhetoric, rhetoric of most of the everyman you the want is that yes. no who's in charge you get the same bullshit and um, it's all the same yeah yeah, yeah. So it doesn't really matter who is in office and uh, it's all about Travis's uh, <laughs> mental alienation yeah exactly but I think it, I think t- for, for me you know, I don't want to 
and listen to the truck, you know, the truck people know. But the, the, the importance of taxi driver is that you, it's still relevant now, or even just as relevant now yeah. than it was when it was first made, because oh, absolutely, yeah. time might have moved on, but like Tom said, shit is still the same, and politicians are still using this in the same way. They still send the boys to get killed um, in places that they don't know, killing people that they've never met, you know, or, or political systems where people are getting hungrier, people are starving, you know, and there's no opportunity to come in or in the middle of a pandemic and the government handling it a certain way, which, you know, majority of people probably don't like. So, you know, I think it's still relevant now to this day. To, I think Absolutely. Taxi clubs are still massively relevant. No, I completely agree I with you. It's, due, really. it's it's kind of funny with these films though. They're like not they're not the advertising that New York in particular would want to be seen, you know. Like if you're doing a street movie, you're not advertising all the niceness of it. You're not trying to re- bring that romanticness into it. Which kind of leads nicely into um Abel Ferreira, because his films are grimy as fuck. They're so grimy. <laughs> I mean, Driller Killer itself was you, your typical uh, parental exploitation horror films. Yeah, but yeah. it really is just a slice of life street film, but with those things, just because he needed to make money, you know, he was a guy from the street. He really wanted that big break. He, he knew that parental horror films were telling. So he wanted to make his film the best way he could to make money, and that was what he did. He just made a guy that goes crazy with a drill. But the film itself is... An incredible slice of life. Though, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, I completely, completely agree with that. And also, I think the different what sets Billy Killer apart is that Scorsese, although he was trying to cash in, like exactly, I was trying to say, he was trying to make money, trying to make a film to get his name. It, it was talking about something. He was talking about art and, and and the way an artist kind of, in order to you know reach that level, he's reached to, will literally become a killer to do it. Yeah. Yeah. In order yeah. to create his art, so it was such an interesting perspective. I think, although you know, it's a bit shabby, a little bit ropey in places, and obviously, Apple Ferrero was going to get better and better. But the actual concept of it, I thought, was a really, really great, you know, a really, really great idea done done quite well, for, especially for first proper. You know, if we don't Absolutely. include, his, uh, you know, if we don't oh. include his, um, <laughs> his porn, his nine lives or pussy or whatever, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of works on its own as a um, film. It's as funny, a when it, used to, when it was re-released on Vision back in the day, I, um, I found the film unwatchable. I just thought, I can't imagine how people can watch this shit. It's unwatchable. I just don't know what's going on. It's just awful. And it's now like up there with my favourites because it's so good. <laughs> you know, it's just, I just understood it and obviously it was the uncut version, the clean up version. Yeah. But it's just such a striking film. It's definitely yeah. rises above most of what the other stuff bit go out at the time and it's just such a good film. Scott, the thing is, it's central weapon as well, the drill, it's just such an aggressive weapon. Because from what I remember, the music and the soundtrack when he's drilling into him, it's it's all this so incredibly intense. Play, it should be played loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a great way to the film. It's almost like an art installation piece, like an yeah. elongated art installation piece for me, not some of the sequences of it. That, that yeah. baffled me when I first saw that. It's like, <laughs> what? You know, this film should be played loud. <laughs> Incredible. Now he followed this up with um, MS forty five. Is that is that correct? That that was the follow up, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was his well, follow up. The Vengeance it was called over That's it. Cool. in a very in a very sensitive form. <laughs> When I, I watched that, like, uh, I only watched that last year and it had a massive impact on me. And I was like, I need to, I don't know, there was something just so sweaty about the film, if that makes sense. Because that paranoia, especially after she, she experiences the abuse and stuff, her character and everyone surrounding her, it felt almost like what Polanski does with his, like, his paranoia flat films from the 60s and 70s. It really just, like, drew me in completely. And then it turns into an exploitation assassin film with one of the greatest soundtracks, oh, yeah. that jazziness, that jazzy... And again, that's thing. just for well, having to work within the genre of trappings. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Exactly. I, I think that it, it might be that, that is kind of um, almost, if you you can compare it to they call it One Eye, in my opinion. I think it's a, it's a very similar oh, film. Shit, yeah, yeah. It's a very similar film, obviously. And it, that was made before. I'm a huge fan of they call it One Eye. I think, it, I think it's a super film. Not, not the hardcore cut, the other cut, because I think the hardcore cut yeah. was pointless. But the actual first cut, it was. I think a powerful rape revenge film, and then Abel Ferrer was almost like a follow up to it. You could you could put to you know, 
companion piece together side by side and watch them. And they've both got similarity. But what Ibel does is he, he turns New York streets into a main character. It's yeah. almost like there's a... I kind of, I feel like when I watch it, it's, it's almost like blaming the New York streets for what's happening as well. <laughs> That's, he's... Abel Ferrer is kind of this relationship with New York where the streets of New York is almost like an underbelly character in all of his films, well, in all of his early films. And it's possessing and everyone to do that. Exactly, thing. and he's possessing yeah. people, you know, there's something dirty on those streets. All there's that steam that's right. Beautiful. It's like, yeah. You know, it's coming up from underneath the sewers and possessing people, exactly like that. But it's also got a beauty to it, and I think that's MS-45 is slightly different from when they call it one-eye, because it's a bit more, it is a more beautiful film to look at. Mm. It is, in some respects, a more powerful and film to look Zoe, at. And uh, of Zoe, Zoe Lund was yeah. the one with her own she voice. Was, yeah. really uh, was. Was amazing, a, iconic a, yeah, imagery. The claimed heroine queen. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she also did a really good film for Larry Cohen for the special effects as well. <laughs> uh, because she didn't want to become one of um, Abel's stable. <laughs> this was her word thing. as didn't want to become another part of Abel's stable. Because kind of um, come back and do bad with him, so. it leads us nicely into um the 80s because obviously ms45 was about, i think 1980 or 79 and of course the 80s being the worst time new york had for crime and it wasn't just so much basic crimes you start getting like sorry my cat's freaking out i'm just sorry. my eyes just got distracted by that it's all this street talk <laughs> <laughs> But we got new kind of uh, darker things, and I'm thinking of uh, Maniac because Maniac is like oh, yeah, of such a grimy, horrible film. Well, so... I think of it, you know, New York and, and America in itself, in through the Sun Slam, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Night Stalker, all these different. Okay, well, the Night Stalker might have been a bit later, after, but um, they'd already had their fair share of serial killers, and and you... that was was very high chance that you know. Someone could get murdered <laughs> in the really brutal, <laughs> you know, um, for no reason. It's, it's interesting yeah. you say that because, like, obviously around that time, you also think uh, Ted Bundy. I think he was convicted yeah. around um, he was just before. Seventies through the eighties, yeah, he was getting people were just yeah, people were dying, and they went <laughs> finding the perpetrator, and you know, the, the bodies were massed up everywhere, and these are just the high profile cases. You know, yeah, there's yeah. so many more. Serial killers, you know, America's the Jews. That's why I think with Maniac, it works so well that it's mostly from the serial killer's perspective, and he's he's an ugly, sweaty kind of. Clearly, got a lot of psychological oh, problems. Just been, I'll just I, I was just yeah. about to say that his performance in that is crazy. It's such a good performance. Of course, really. we reckon we're again. He's just somebody who's just so despicable and so repulsive, but you just can't help but just be reeled in by what he's doing and just following him. He's yeah, yeah, incredible, incredible guy. Like you know, he's, he's, everything he was in, I just I'd entertain. Because he's a legend, and Lustig, yeah, he, you know, again, he was another guy working in the genre and just finding out know, what sells. And I guess in that's how all these films are born. Really, what sells is serial yeah. killers doing nasty things to each other. That he obviously up to the ante a bit there and kind of pushed it, pushed the envelope. Well, yeah, like, there, there was nothing making him into a person, you know, making him into a human being who was who was tortured and he was yeah. suffering. It's not, yeah, it's not your charismatic costume wearing serial killer. It's not trying to create a franchise out of a character or anything. It's just no a brutally no. grim character. And the end is just incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, end, the end is so powerful. Even now, it's still really powerful. That is a sort of personal hell kind of thing. You can imagine he's, <laughs> he's experiencing this every night. Yeah. <laughs> But it, kind of, it led to, it did lead to these much more um, yeah like on on a because again cruising is a weird one because sh- sure it's kind of got that street realness but it also has a lot of borderline stereotypical things of you know the kind of negative side to what people take with gay people and in particular the BDSM kind of scene. Well, you could cross cruising into what obviously Lustig himself went into, and that was a film called Gelanti, and Gelantiism was a big, a big thing for these films. Yeah, yeah. You know, your, your death wishes and whatnot, but that was yeah. not to make Gelanti. And to a degree, uh, in a really twisted way, you could see that this uh, serial killer in cruising was being, was, was you know, upon himself to be the uh, Gelanti angel of death, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, he, cruising was based. Correct me if I'm wrong. But cruising was based on a, on an actual killer at the time that was working within the community. Or, I, I believe. If I'm I think correct, it was. Yeah. Of which, yeah, I mean, before, so you know, it would have been yeah. a frequent um, occurrence, I imagine. I mean, I, I think I think Cruise is a really interesting film. I think it it's very off. It's almost a bit off key for freaking it. It's, it doesn't really sit in the other body of work that he's got. But in mm. some respects, it sits exactly in the body of work he's got because it, it it got his kind of temperament to it. But it just feels a little bit different from me. I can see what you mean about the stereotypes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I was just saying, going back to what you uh, French Connection, it's got that ambiguous ending, much like what Cruising yeah. has, you know. Yeah. It's, it's like but I, I, quite like, I, I quite like that ambiguous ending. I don't know why people don't really appeal, appeal to it. I kind of, I think he's exposed to who it actually was. It's meant to be... Um, in the voice of it. I can't actually, I can't remember myself actually how big this is, but I heard an interview yeah, saying, Yeah, you're, you're right. absolutely right. I'm thinking now. It's a, it's a it, I think, he, line, I think it? he said it was something, I think it was his father or something like that that was the killer or something right. like that. Yeah. That's what he, he mentioned in an interview that, because I got the edition, the, the Arrow release of it, because I really like the film. Um, and I agree with, I agree with what Sam's saying and the, the stereotypical kind of portrayal of the gay community. I still think he's got enough credibility within the door to that kind of bypasses that. Mm-hmm. And it's really funny how it splits the, the gay community as well, because you get a lot of the, the gay community who actually go, no, this is a great, great film, and actually captured yeah, a time they, in New York. They weren't really attacking it for being so negative, weren't they? But yeah. I do remember but having you know, also got... grooming with a character in it who was actually really quite a nice portrayal of yeah, exactly. um, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's what I mean. It kind of that's sits what... in an awkward position, but like it still it still works, and it still is a strong story. And it was a story that wasn't being told at that time. And I think again, that's the important thing with these street movies. They are a bit grimy and gritty, but they're trying to tell you something that you're not paying. You know, you know what your eye on. You know, because of your own kind of social environment. Yeah, I really need to give that a watch again because I remember. Being really quite thrilled that the the germs, the, the the film score, and obviously Darby Crash was one of the only openly gay punk vocalists at the time. And uh, yeah, the score is incredible. A lot of connotations the, the, to the S and subculture, and which is really quite <laughs> quite a pride in un- underbelly in itself, but obviously one for fun. <laughs> But yeah. I think the score is great. The sound design on the film as well is incredible. It, it, I mean, the sound design really gets under your skin when you're watching it. It's that kind of, which obviously, you know, he freaking was, I think, one of the best at with the way he sound in film. He, in the, in the Hollywood, you know, industry anyway, and then the way that the sound design gets under your skin when you're watching it, it's slowly yeah. building that tempo as you're watching the film. It's, it is incredible. I really, really, I highly I recommend it. Really watch, uh, yeah, rewatch it, man. It's, yeah. really, it's really good. Yeah. It is really good. I do remember the look that he gives himself in the mirror at the end. It's almost like... And um, also, what a brave, what a brave performance for Pacino to kind of do that because he obviously... Before he we went on TV, really, <laughs> It was like early actor Pacino rather than crazy gravity yeah. uh, OTT Pacino. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think, I, I think Pacino's early career was was amazing. Like he did Panic in Needle Park, which you could say oh, that was is, a good one. Yeah, is, that is, a, is a New York street film. You know, it's about uh, true, you know, yeah. addicts, and that kind of ties right in with that kind of the genre of the street films. And, you know, and it's Serpico, which is again about bent cops on the streets of New York. I mean, it, it's and that the kind of director who should really yeah. be acknowledged. Yeah, that is brilliant. Oh, he's incredible. Yeah, I'm a big fan of him. I think his style is just superb. His characterizations yeah. of people is just incredible. So, yeah, I think, you know, Pacino for Pacino, that was the, even though the film I don't think turned out the way he wanted it to be, I still think it's an interesting. I think, you know, uh, the, I think Freakin' is most interesting is flawed, and I think that's where. Before we went out, before he actually pushed that threshold into making films that people could call terrible, he was making films that were that didn't perform well. But people looking back at him now, thinking, "Wow, that's so so bold," you know, yeah, like yeah. Sorcerer, you know, was another one that fell under. Yeah, kind of... yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Again, Sorcerer is one that I think deserves another watch. Absolutely. For anyone out there that hasn't seen it in a while, I've watched it because I watched it again recently in it. It, I liked it much better seeing it now than I did when I watched it 10 years ago. I think you do need to kind of 
find your feet with a few of these films and watch them yeah. w- once and then once you know what you're meant for then you can have a chance to see what's really going on in them exactly yeah, yeah. exactly if we uh, if we look a bit more towards on the street films in regards to the more um there's a, there's always a side to street films especially a bit later with Abel Ferrer and other people the the cathartic side of it and I'm talking in particular with uh, Bad Lieutenant and of course when you see the darkest grime and sides but you see a sense of redemption towards the end. And um, you see that more into the 90s street films and a bit later where redemption became quite a key aspect rather than just uh, ob- observing the disgusting chaos of it all. You could argue well, Taxi Driver's um, Redemption, but there's still the motivation. Well, I've, um, I've got to throw in um, Luigi Arvanazzo because he's one of the great independent filmmakers of like, you know, New York street films. Mm. His combat shock film is obviously one of those great films. Trauma. But uh, he made a film called No Way Home with Tim Roth, and again, that's all yeah, about the second chance. Yeah, it's all about the second yeah. chance redemption. It's combat shock obviously ends really, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's got one of those great endings. Um, but No Way Home, he gave, gave us a happier ending. Yeah, I got, he gave his character chance to start again. You know. Yeah. yeah. And it's always it was involved in taking that bus out of town, much like the end of Midnight Cowboy. You know, you know, they finally yeah. got that bus ticket, riding off into the sunset. That kind of that's thing, it. That yeah. kind of, that is, that is. He gave Tim Roth the chance to do that in No Way Home, which is really quite nice because you just think it's all going to end. But I, quite, I, I really like the way that they play with that. I think it's a nod to you know early Hollywood cinema. With things like you know over the rainbow and you know Wizard of Oz and all that nonsense, where you you know you just walk off to the sunset and it will be alright. I kind of think that we're kind of half, you know, pushing pushing buttons when they were doing endings like that in street films. Because yes, they were they did give them a sense of hope, but there was a sense of hope with a lot of damage attached to it. And I know yeah. and that right really interesting. That show was brilliant, absolutely superb film. Super. How much can no way home? They're both the products of Staten Island. You know, they're both yeah. Staten Island. Uh, they're, oh. they're products of what again? What he would see on the streets. He was using real addicts in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, think, I mean, um, yeah, but he just gave. He just felt the need to uh, give someone, give one of his characters a chance to escape Staten Island. Like he did. You know, he mm. got to yeah. escape Staten Island. He's still burned to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but going back to <laughs> go Ferrera for a second. I mean, I because I'm a huge Ferrera fan, huge for, and and Bad Lieutenant. I put that up there in my top five films of all time. I think absolutely it's probably his masterpiece. Yeah, I think Amazing. this is masterpiece. I think it's an incredibly grimy, dark, very little dialogue as well. It's, it's very little dialogue. Let in the environment yeah, breathe. Exactly. In it, there's certain moments where Kaitel's just, and let's just say that's Kaitel for me, that's Kaitel's best performance. He's oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, mag- you know, he's magnificent in it. He, he's from the moment you see him to the last shot of him walking away, not knowing where he's going. Is this powerhouse performance where I, I don't, I can't think of a better performance when I think of that era. Personally, I think his performance is. I'd agree. It's it's so real. And have you noticed as well a lot of the dialogue in that film? It's almost like the the sound is uh, deliberately quite muted or muffled because it doesn't really matter what they say. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, exactly. But also the imagery. For me, it's still got one of the scariest moments, and it's not even a horror film, where he's in that moment where he's, you know, praying to God and he turns around and sees Jesus Christ standing there, bleeding, looking at him, judging him. You know, passing judgment on him is just one of the most powerful yeah, well, bits yeah, of cinema okay. I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you running? It's brilliant. But that's but that to me is the power of Abel Ferreira. The way he can switch from that realism to the hyperbole that way that that you you're in this moment of you're in fantasy mode here. You're in man's mind. You know, you're in you you stepping into his uh, mania at that particular yeah. moment as you see Jesus looking at him, but you know, judging him. It's those moments and where the, the, the nun is looking at him and they're expecting that she's been raped and there's that kind of dead look on her in her eyes. The moments in Bad Lieutenant for me that stand by pretty much most other films because Abel Ferreira for me 
was using the streets of New York as the biggest character in any one of his films at that particular moment. Yeah. And, and and New York almost pollutes everybody and pollutes. And, and what he was trying to say, I think, there was how New York had this underbelly of, you know, the grime. We can look at it as a physical level, the buildings and the people, but then you, there's something else inside of it, like the whole place is rotten. And that's what I think people so forever was doing. Well. That's what's so bold as well is um, it does cut to that and being raped. Um, it's almost like a different style of film. Mm. Yeah. He's cut. Yeah. Like, he's, he's using a different cutting style. It's almost like a different pace. It's almost like he's throwing us a clip from a different film, but then he does yeah. derail the film. It's almost exactly. like that's sort of like, this is the, this is the, this is the event now that's kind of sparked the rest of his uh, Ex- journey. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like that. A shattering glass motif, where you, you know, yeah, which starts a trend of events that happen to him. It's brilliant. Can also, have you noticed in that particular scene that there's almost like a softness to the lens that we're looking at as well? It's not as yeah, hot exactly, yeah. as what we're looking at. It, yeah, it's such a world. Much more kind of art, there's much more kind of like a stylized uh, artistry to that bit. Mm. Absolutely, man. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think also with these films, like, there's always the element of having to try and escape. Uh, sometimes literally, like we've said before, with the bus at the end. And with Bad Lieutenant, he's so rotten into the core, like you said, that he's never going to escape. Yeah. He, he just thinks that his soul is damned because um, Ferraro, his films are much more explicit Catholic than his Mean Streets is, you know, even though Mean yeah. Street is yeah, very much a Catholic uh, film. But... Um, as writer, uh, is it Nicholas uh, St. John? Is it? He's a very uh, deep Catholic uh, writer and, and believer, and I think really did come to a head with I think, and there's the most explicit Catholic film. I was going to go back to Miss 45 as well, you know, the, the fact that she's a nun, and uh, yeah, exactly. Nun with a gun, yeah. But uh, it's very much the fact that he knows that his soul is damned unless he does something about it. He mm. knows he ain't getting out of the set. Like he's everybody knows that he could possibly try and save his soul. <laughs> it's such a beautiful film, and it's so tragic in the end, in the final sequence, where he has his redemption, but then reality is still in play, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the choice of music at that particular moment as well. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, it's the main theme in the film, but that choice of music is just such a beautiful choice of music, which kind of sing, you know. It just kind of leads him out because I think where he, where he's particular going, he, that's that's almost like he's just to hell. I don't think there is any redemption for him. Yeah. Although, although Abel Ferreira's films are all about redemption, all of the characters in all of his films, especially the ones that are mostly set in in New York and, and that you know in that period, are about redemption. It's characters trying to find a sense of redemption, and, that, and and but in that one, he was almost saying there is no redemption. Mm. And that's, okay. I like to think that he's doomed, you know. Yeah, he's doomed. Yeah. He's a doomed character. He's kind of gone too far. He's over, gone over the precipice way. There's no way back. There's no yeah. way back. Yeah. Because these, these New York films. that version with the Scully Deep track, isn't it? With the original theatrical one. Yeah. Seen. If you can get hold of that one, then you're in the film, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what a rarity. I wanted to mention one more Abel Ferreira film because they, they all, they're all in the same sort of bubble. Now, all these street films, they're really, they're films about class to some degree because they're showing poverty at its most extremes. And um, I'm thinking of um, The Addict, which I know is also a vampire oh, yeah. film. But that's the one of my... The vampire one. Yeah. The Addiction, yeah. The Addiction, that's it, yeah. That's like, I absolutely love that film. I love the cinematography. I think the black and white yeah, is yeah. so mesmerizing. That one even looks more low budget than... Look at that, you know. <laughs> but it's so grimy, isn't it? You but really the feel the street The cinematography is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. The cinematography is beautiful. Like the shots underneath the the kind of uh, the, obviously New York's got different kind of streets than, than we have, but it's those underground sequences where it's almost like a film noir. You're looking at a film yeah. noir uh, film. It, it's so it is really really beautifully shot. Really really beautifully shot. It's an interesting love, film as well. I absolutely love the fact that he he stayed strictly independent and fiercely independent, even though he yeah. found himself working with the likes of Madonna and. He kind of worked his way up through these channels, but he just never stopped being who it was, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I can exactly. imagine he's an absolute kind of crazy mofo to work with on set, and he'll never change his way for anybody. And it's just quite incredible, really. Mm. Fiercely independent, he's always been. I think that comes down to whether 
you see film as an art form, or you see it as an expression of art, or you see it as Come as a means to a career to kind Absolutely. of you know that, make yeah. big blockbuster moves. And Abe Carrera is a he is an artist, he's a complete artist. Yeah. You know, whether it's using shit as you you know shit as your oil, and you know the streets as a canvas, and that's probably what he was doing. He's you know that's he didn't choose a nice white black drop with lovely paints he just grimed it up so everything was everything that he saw around him and knew but I think he's an artist he's a complete artist I thought forever yeah I completely agree complete yeah, yeah. completely agree it, it, it's a need for him isn't it he's, yeah because he's got other films as well you can look at I think China Girl is a great film China Girl you know those a little bit poppy a little bit for him a little bit yeah, hard, yeah, but still China Girl's got was, moments he, I think he was like kind of Working his way up with the in the system there, kind of exactly. playing ball, delivering the kind of films they want from him. Exactly, but it still had that connotation. He's kind of it still had him in it. It still had his yeah. artistic voice in it. It wasn't just churning so out films for for you know. For Fear the Sick is the same as well. Yeah, Fear Sick. So, yeah. I wanted to um because we're as we're coming towards an end point. Um, obviously. There are a lot of like um, drug films related within uh, street movies. I didn't want to talk about them because they deserve their own discussion because they're so tied in with what was happening uh, socially and politically. So I just wanted to go over, do we think there are any uh, modern examples of that old sort of street movie value? I um, I just wanted to say that because of obviously like a lot of gentrification has happened to certain areas, you, you do lose some of that grime. But the uh, Safdie brothers, who did Uncut Gems and uh, Good Times, they seem to be harking right. back to that old school style. It's in those those aesthetics as, as more than anything I'm in right now. You know, um, as for the content, I mean, I can't say because I haven't seen those films. But there's a lot of people still making these films. You just you just never hear about them unless you really go exactly. looking for them as well. Yeah, that's true. exactly. I think I think it's still being made. We just kind of <laughs> I say we because <laughs> we probably make films that are like that that are just kind of under the surface. Yeah, I mean, Uncut Gems. I think stylistically, because I've seen Uncut Gems and Uncut Gems looks great, and it does definitely have that kind of 1970s kind of New York kind shouting. of vibe to it. Everyone's shouting at each other, but. Yeah, exactly. It has that, but I don't think it has the griminess. In my opinion, it didn't have the griminess that those films captured. Maybe because times have moved on and that mm. grime is no longer seen as grime. I don't know. Yeah, it's but hard to uh, capture that on digital. It's like, hard yeah, to capture that, yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if it, it's a great film. You know, I think it's a superb film. I don't think it's that same level. And there might be filmmakers out there that are doing it, but I'm not. I can't think of any off the top of my head that kind of capturing that. No, it's I've strange. Just it? got my head stuck in the past when it comes to cinema. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. <laughs> I'm a little bit, bit nostalgic to the seventies films. The thing is, for yeah, such a yeah, I think if you if it was made after nineteen ninety four, that's the cut off for. <laughs> <laughs> You'd yeah. think though, for such uh, most an, of our films are for such yeah. an iconic city. <laughs> New York is like consistently always filmed. Yeah, it's always filmed in a lot of romantic comedies or. Mostly comedies. There seems to be a lot of comedy in New York. But you would think with yeah. everything that's still there and independent filmmakers having that history of those grimy films that there would be more out there. And maybe there is more. Maybe it's one of those things that if anyone's listening, throw down some modern versions of what you would call a New York street movie. But you do see those kind of aesthetics in more modern films. And I know that like personally, I, w- I like to try and do it because Portsmouth's a horrible little city. And there's lots of grimy little bits, and it's fun to find those areas to tell your darker stories. Well, there, there's yeah. definitely are those grime, grimy corners still in existence because it's always going to be a class struggle. But uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. The likes of Forty Second Street, they're just they're different for the past, aren't they? You know. Mm. And obviously, a lot of the uh, the blue movie businesses and all the little skin flick uh, little cinemas, there's grimy little cinemas, or just all these just little horns where you would go and. Find all these kind of shady characters and all that. A lot of them has been, you know, they're, 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 they're out and all these chain businesses are in. And yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think a lot of it is to do with corporations completely yeah. dominating cinema and, and making those indie films and releasing on theatre now is really, really difficult unless you're paying it a good ball. Yeah, but it's not the kind of thing environment. I would have loved to have made a film and you know, had my film playing on 42nd Street. That would have been, you know, oh, but, but that's because I have nostalgia for that kind of cinema and that kind of time. 
I don't think it's around anymore because as as Sam said, I think a lot of everything's been gentrified. So yeah, a lot of years. a lot you know the vast struggle that's happening is affecting the film industry because of what the output what we're putting out there. Well, the real estate yeah. obviously was the real estate takeover was in its growth throughout the seventies, eighties. You know, like yeah. the Trump points and whatnot. Yeah. So these are the characters we're being punched down to that we're watching in these films, and now we've seen a complete kind of take of her to the point where it is the, the corporate reign you know, mm. you know, mm. and we're yeah. a bit, the, the chasm's ever deeper it's kind of interesting you say that because you do see more like if you think of like just general TV film whatever you see a lot more evil kind of vindictive characters within richness like shows like Succession mm. and Billions and things like that and they're all set within like New York because it's the sense well, of what's Wall ridiculous Street. is the fact that they became the stable bad guy in all these mainstream films. It's almost like the big studios were recognising the fact that they were buying out everything. So they're like, well, they're obviously the bad guys. <laughs> so films like that is not included. You know, you've got this lovely little tenement building with real people living in there, and then obviously the corporate people want to just knock their building down. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. They recognise that, that that is what is wrong. Like those but, are the villains, but they're, but they're the still turning into a sellable. Exactly, this will yeah. turn it into a celebrity item to sell back to the people that are watching yeah, stories out about exactly. it. It's just an ongoing cycle of, of you know, absolutely. That, yeah. I wanted to um, say one last thing before we finish because the cats are getting restless, which means they're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to. Um, <laughs> if you think about New York as a city, because New York is always a city that's very much the city of love, as they describe it community driven everyone comes together and stuff and because of their long history when these films existed were tied to the crime that was actually happening in it at the highest levels possible and with terrible mayors like uh, Ed Koch and things like that after 9/11 you kind of feel like there's this real distraction away from doing films that show those grimness and I, and I wonder if you guys kind of agree with that or not it definitely was a watershed moment in terms of uh, people's um, paranoid mindsets and culture in general. So I'm guessing you're right. You know. I, think, I think you're right. And also, I think that in the 70s and 80s, during the street move, movie you know, kind of movement, there was a lot of introspection. People were looking into themselves, how what's going wrong inside of us that when we need to change in America. But, but now, it's a lot of what's going on that's bad outside of America rather than looking in. And that's obviously yeah, that's Trumpism. Right. This is all this stuff where there's nothing wrong with us. We're fine. You know, it, it's everybody else. And I think that's been reflected, you know, in the kind of cinema that's coming out of America at the moment, which majority of it is completely uninteresting to me. I agree. Maybe we'll but see at a the same time. The classic horror film is the threat from outside, isn't it? Ex- yeah. Exactly. Inside. Exactly. Whereas the 70s was much more about introspection what's going on in here. We're corrupt. There's something wrong with us. We need to fix it. Let's that's look right. at it. Discuss it. Whereas that's what not the happening. Answer, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us, guys. Um, I hope people have got some just a new introduction to some films they might not have wanted, or not wanted, but not checked out. So, yeah, check out those films, and we'll be back next week. Tom, Kamal, thank you for joining us. Have a lovely day. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you very much, mate. Pleasure. Pleasure. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah.